You know what this is, right? It's a pipe. For some people, especially men of a certain age, it's a means to exude authority. Oh, but wait, here it says it's not a pipe. Ah, uh, it's actually a painting of a pipe. The painter added the text to confuse the viewer. So, here's a real one. Can you smell it? I don't think so. And that's because this is as much a real pipe as this is one. So, whatever these are, they're certainly not pipes. You know what this is? It's an electron. An electron is a little charged ball, cloud, thing. Let me dazzle you by summing up its properties like mass, charge, spin states and why not wavelength. Yet despite all these numbers I don't have a clue what an electron looks like or what mass is or charge or spin really are. So yes, I can just sum up properties without really knowing what they mean or what they even try to describe exactly. And so I'm just showing you this little ball as a metaphor for an electron. Why? Well, because most people can relate to a ball, a spinning ball, a charged ball. Anyway, whatever this is, I'm pretty sure it's nothing remotely like an electron. This is a photon, at least this is the way that it's often depicted. And that's because we assign both particle and wave properties to it. Therefore, it's often displayed as some wavy particle, some discrete intermediate between the emission and the absorption of radiation. A particle of light, if you want, traveling from A to B, right? Well, I guess that's not what it is. Here it says a photon can be described as an amount of energy and momentum. Nowhere does it say that it's some kind of localized wavy particle of radiation, nor do these formulas tell you anything about a shape or a size. So that is what a photon is, just energy exchanged between matter and radiation or vice versa. So if that is what a photon really is, a much better graphics representation of it would probably be something like this. Here the arrow represents the photon being transferred from matter to radiation. The photon isn't the radiation per se, it's the energy put into the radiation. Likewise, when energy is absorbed from a field by an atom, the term photon would refer to the energy transferred from radiation to matter. And if you think about this a bit more, the photon being emitted and the photon being absorbed can be unrelated to each other because the total field in the absorption can be the result of many photon emissions. And so the photon in the absorption is probably not even the same energy. So whatever this is here, we can safely say that it's definitely not a good depiction of a photon. If you've seen the previous two videos I made about coherence and light, you'll know that I personally like to focus on the wave properties of light. And that's because I'm working in optics and so I'm almost exclusively in the business of manipulating light in the visible wavelength range. Almost any phenomenon that I encounter in optics can be explained by assuming that light is just an electromagnetic wave. Refraction, that's just a wave going from one medium to another medium where it has a different propagation speed. Reflection, just waves bouncing off surfaces. Interference, just a linear superposition of waves. And in fact, all these basic principles for the manipulation of light work in exactly the same way at any intensity level. So, from the perspective of classical optics and the way that light can be manipulated as a wave, thinking in terms of photons is completely unnecessary. So why are we constantly referring to photons when we talk about electromagnetic radiation? Well, as I just illustrated, in order to detect this radiation, we need something to interact with it, like electrons. And when you study the interaction between radiation and matter, you'll find that it is quantized in nature, that not just any random amount of energy is being transferred, but discrete and well-defined amounts of energy. And what we also find is that these amounts are always linear with the frequency of the radiation involved. And for the light in the visible wavelength range, the quantized nature of the interaction becomes especially apparent at very low radiative intensities. Because in that case, the transfer of energy only occurs occasionally. Now the question that I have, and you might have as well, is whether the observed quantization in the interaction really proves that radiation is quantized, that all electromagnetic radiation itself consists of discrete packages of energy, or that 
Alternatively, the quantization we observe is merely the result of how the interaction works. And since there is no way to detect radiation without interacting with it, it's difficult to distinguish between energy quantization being a property of light, a property of matter, or a property that emerges from the interaction between the two. The thing is, if you consider a photon to be a particle of light traveling from A to B, then all experiments involving light interference, as for example observed in the double slit experiment, don't make much sense. But if you consider the photon to be the discrete and probabilistic transfer of energy between radiation and matter, things suddenly become pretty trivial. In that case, the probability of something happening is linearly proportional to the intensity, or if you want, with the square of the local electromagnetic field strength. And so, the process is just more likely to occur where the field is high. In this view, the photon, the quantization and the probability of energy transfer are just consequences of how light interacts with matter and they are not a fundamental property of radiation itself. In this video I want to see if we can gain a bit more understanding about wave behavior and the relationship to energy. This video is not a scientific study, it's just intended to tickle the imagination of a few nerdy brains and to maybe present insights from a slightly different angle. I'm not claiming to present the truth here, so feel free to disagree on any aspect. I'd like to start off by showing you a few experiments using the most basic representation of a wave. A one-dimensional linear wave in an elastic string. The waves we generate are transverse waves, which means that the displacement or amplitude of the wave is perpendicular to the direction of wave propagation. Another type of wave is the longitudinal wave, where amplitude and wave propagation are parallel. And the latter type is for example found in the case of sound waves. Now the experimental setup is not complex and I actually built it on the kitchen table. So to create the waves in the string I used a modified speaker cone that is connected to an audio amplifier and that amplifier in turn gets its harmonic signal input from a function generator. And here you can see that I glued a plastic pillar in the speaker cone to which a string can be attached. I thought I'd start out by showing you how waves are introduced by displacement of the cone and how they then propagate along the string. In this example I left the string a bit longer and connected the far side to the kitchen sink. A single wave pulse is introduced in the string and you can observe how the wave propagates through the string to the other side. Here it reflects back and then travels in the opposite direction where it also reflects again on the speaker. And this process is repeated until the friction with the air and the elastic material has dissipated all the wave energy. The movement of the speaker cone displaces the string and thereby gives the string kinetic energy in the transverse direction. But at the same time it also stretches and compresses it in the longitudinal direction. And this creates a longitudinal wave in the material, a sound wave if you want, which actually moves faster through the string than the transverse wave can. If you've watched carefully, you might even have spotted the effects of the longitudinal wave in the previous images. Next step in the experiment is limiting the length of the string to a smaller, well-defined region. And if we generate waves on one side, they are reflected on the other side and can bounce around for some time, same as we saw before. Using a continuous oscillation, we can in principle introduce waves of any frequency into the string. But with some frequencies we observe a special condition in which a standing wave forms in the string. And when this happens, the string resonates and the transverse amplitudes observed suddenly become much higher. The standing wave in the string with the lowest frequency is observed at around 8 Hz, which holds just one antinode. If we increase the frequency of the signal injected into the string, we can observe several standing wave conditions all occurring at multiples of 8 Hz. And between these specific resonance frequencies, you'll generally observe that the string moves in some irregular way. So creating standing waves is all about introducing exactly the right value for the oscillation frequency. Now I want to show you a few aspects of standing waves. First, how they're formed, starting from a string at rest. 
In this image you see the same string multiple times. Now watch what happens when standing waves with various resonance frequencies are introduced in the string. This is slow motion footage recorded with a smartphone, so it's not very detailed. But if we look at the startup again, it's clear that it takes some time for the standing waves to build up and reach a maximum amplitude. And during that time, the waves are basically accumulating energy. Energy that's constantly supplied in phase with the wave energy already present. This buildup of energy continues until at some point the loss of energy, for example due to friction, reaches an equilibrium with the power that we put in. Let me show you what happens if we stop the energy input for all these standing waves. We observe that the amplitudes go down fairly rapidly due to the effects of friction, with the highest frequencies going down more quickly. But notice that the number of antinodes remains the same during the decay in all cases. We do not, for example, observe transitions in the string where the number of antinodes suddenly changes. And so, if there were no friction and no influences from the outside, these wave modes would basically be stable forever. Let's for a moment consider how energy is distributed in this system. Here you see the shape of the string at different times during the harmonic cycle of the standing wave. The oscillation we observe is basically the result of two different types of energy at play. First, there is the kinetic energy, which is contained in the velocity at which the mass of the string moves. So it's basically present as momentum. Second, there is potential energy, which is contained in the elongation of the string. Now, kinetic energy is easy to spot. It's basically the movement that we observe. It has the highest value when the string is flat and it's zero when the string has reached maximum amplitude. And so kinetic energy is found in the antinodes and in principle has zero value in the nodes. Potential energy is a bit trickier, but for a pure transverse standing wave, the highest energy density is found where the stretch in the string is largest, meaning that most potential energy is stored in or closely around the nodes. And so in a standing wave, the energy is constantly converted back and forth from potential energy stored in the elastic material to kinetic energy present as mass in motion. Now, one of the questions I had myself was the following. How does a string handle the switching between different standing wave modes? For example, if a string is in a state with three nodes and we suddenly introduce a frequency that would require a stable wave of two nodes, how does the wave in the string deal with this change and then convert into the new wave mode. Because a linear superposition of the start and end situation is not a standing wave, right? Just look at how both the potential and kinetic energy are very unevenly distributed over the length of the string. So how does the transition between standing wave states work in practice? Well, let's find out. Here I created a transition going from four to three antinodes. Now, that happened pretty quickly, so let's take a look at that again in a little more detail. In the time between the two modes, we observe some kind of additional oscillation along the string from one side to the other for a couple of cycles. And here you see the same experiment with five to four antinodes, and you observe something similar. So apparently the energy redistribution during the transition also involves some kind of oscillation. Now let's see if we can measure what the frequency of this oscillation is. The easiest way to listen in on the oscillation in a string is to add an additional speaker on the other side. Speakers can of course generate sound waves, but they can also serve as a microphone, because when we move the cone, the coil inside generates a voltage signal across the leads. And so with a second speaker in the longitudinal direction, we can listen in on the potential energy variations, because in this orientation, the potential energy component in the string is harmonically pulling on the cone of speaker B. If we use an oscilloscope to compare the signal from speaker B with respect to the transverse oscillation introduced by speaker A, we measure that the potential energy variations have two times the frequency of the injected kinetic energy wave which is to be expected based on the energy distribution in a string of a standing wave that I showed previously. Now let's measure what happens if we change the frequency from one standing wave mode to the other. Here you see the scope image on a somewhat longer time scale. 
And at this point in time, the frequency is switched. And in the potential energy graph at the end of the string, we observe some additional harmonic oscillation. If we look a bit closer at the nature of these low frequency oscillations, we observe that it's actually very similar to amplitude modulation. And if we measure the frequency of the modulation in the signal, it always turns out to be the difference in frequency between the two transverse frequencies that we switch between. Now this difference between two frequencies is generally called a beat frequency. And if we study this a bit closer, we can relate the value of the observed beat frequency to the energy wave that we just saw running through the string from left to right. Now, why did I want to show you all this? Well, that's because there are several analogies between standing waves in a string and the way that, for example, an electron behaves when confined in space. I know comparing the behavior of a macroscopic string with something as elementary as an electron is tricky to say the least. For one, because a string can basically have any energy at a specific frequency, which is not the case in the electron. But I think that we can sometimes still learn a lot from an analogy even though it's not 100% correct. The wave-like properties of elementary particles, especially of electrons, have been demonstrated in various experiments. For example, in the double-slit experiment for single electrons, where we observe that the wavelength of the electrons is dependent on their momentum, simply put, dependent on their velocity given they have mass. Now, the reason we can measure the wavelength of the electrons relatively easily is that their mass is very small and so the resulting wavelength is relatively long compared to that of heavier particles. But the electron is not the type of wave that we're familiar with. If the momentum, so the velocity of the electron increases, its wavelength becomes shorter. But this would also mean that the wavelength of the electron must go to infinity if the velocity goes down to zero. It's quite weird actually if you take this relationship literally. So, a better way to look at this is to state that the electron is governed by some intrinsic uncertainty between position and momentum. Let's assume that the total energy of the electron is contained in some sort of local spatial oscillation and that this energy of oscillation is directly related to its frequency. Then increasing the momentum of the electron significantly will require an increase in frequency and therefore lead to a more confined wave. So I guess the uncertainty relationship is not so much about the exact values of the momentum and the position, but how these properties relate to each other in a wave-like entity when you change either one of them. And this is actually fundamental to wave systems like the electron and sets limits to what we can know about a certain combination of its properties. Now, since the electron has wavelength, it must also have frequency, right? And so, a reasonable question to ask might be, what is the true nature of the oscillation in the electron? What is oscillating and how? Because in order to maintain an oscillation, there must at least be two types of energy involved, similar to the potential and kinetic energy that we saw at play in the string. Regardless of the exact nature of the oscillation, the main thing that I'd like to point out is the following. Given the wave properties of the electron, it's possible to calculate how the wave of the electron having a certain amount of energy or frequency would behave when confined in space. For example, because it's bound to the nucleus of an atom by electrostatic forces. And the simplest atomic system for which this is the case is the hydrogen atom. So let's take a quick look at this system. The hydrogen atom consists of just one electron and one proton. Both the proton and the electron have mass and they both have wave properties. However, the wave properties are most apparent in the electron since it's about 1800 times lighter than the proton. And the attractive forces resulting from their opposite charge keep the electron and the proton together. Because of the much higher mass of the proton, it's basically the center of mass and the spatial confinement of the electron is governed by the attraction to the proton. Now, given the wave properties of the electron and the electrostatic confinement of the wave, it's possible to calculate which standing waves of the electron would be stable inside the hydrogen atom. And the result of this calculation is a list of various possible wave states or 
wave functions, each of which describes the electron having a specific frequency and energy state. If we put low pressure hydrogen gas in a tube and then excite the molecules inside the tube, for example by running a current through it, we observe the emission of light at all kinds of very distinct wavelengths. A few of these are in the visible range, but there are many other frequencies emitted in the infrared and in the UV range. Now it turns out that each of these emission frequencies can be traced back to a transition between two specific energy states of the electron. Apart from emitting specific frequencies of radiation, atomic hydrogen also selectively absorbs specific frequencies of light. And if you look at the emission and absorption spectra, you see that these processes involve exactly the same frequencies and atomic energy transitions. Now, when I did the experiment with the string involving a beat frequency and noticed this kinetic and potential energy wave running around the confinement, I got the following idea. Could this be an analogy or metaphor for what happens with the electron when it switches to a lower energy state and emits radiation? If the presence of the electron and its energy is described by a standing wave, then going to another energy would also require the redistribution of the electron in space, including its charge. Making the electron change from one frequency to another would also involve an oscillation, because any intermediate state between the two states is not a stable standing wave, but a spatial oscillation at the beat frequency. So, in the case of the electron, this dragging around of charge in space would result in the generation of electromagnetic radiation at the beat frequency. One of the key aspects at the basis of quantum mechanics is the discovery that energy and frequency are always directly related by a constant. And the constant is called Planck's constant, named after Max Planck who first proposed it. Now personally I look at the nature of this relationship in the following way. If energy is always directly related to a specific frequency, then differences in energy must also relate to a difference in frequency. And so effectively this means that any system that only knows discrete energy levels or wave states can only exchange energy with a specific frequency. And this frequency, ladies and gentlemen, is the beat frequency. Now if you look at it from this perspective, then the quantization of radiation, aka the photon, is really not a property of radiation. It's a direct result of how confined standing wave systems, like for example an electron, deal with changing their energy states. Now I guess that showing the presence of a beat frequency between two standing waves in a string is mostly an illustration for the case of the emission of radiation. The analogy being that the radiation is the result of the redistribution of the electron and its corresponding charge at the beat frequency. But what about an analogy for the absorption of radiation? From the emission and absorption spectra of hydrogen, we've seen that in the standing wave states of the electron, energy transfer with the beat frequency also works the other way. So is it maybe possible to find an analogy that involves a beat frequency to make a string switch standing wave mode? Well, it turns out that achieving this in a string is actually far from trivial. Say we have a transverse standing wave frequency of 32 Hz and we want to transform it to a standing wave of 40 Hz. How would we do that in practice using a wave with a frequency of only 8 Hz? You cannot achieve this by superimposing transverse energy of 8 Hz onto a standing wave of 32 Hz, because superimposing transverse waves with frequencies of 8 and 32 Hz will just create a complex wave containing a beat frequency of 24 Hz, the difference between 32 and 8 Hz. Which is not what we want, because we want to end up with a stable standing wave of 40 Hz. Now, I tried a lot of things to make this happen. And at some point I realized that I should actually try to manipulate the phase of the waves in the string. Because it's phase differences that relate the two original frequencies with the beat frequency. And the easiest way I saw for doing this is to fiddle around with one specific type of energy, in this case potential energy. So instead of listening in on the potential energy with the second speaker, I tried modifying phase with it by means of modifying the potential energy at the end of the string. 
So in practice, for the example I just gave, I would create a 32 Hz transfer standing wave using speaker A, then stop the energy feed and let the wave run free, and then inject an 8 Hz longitudinal wave to make it switch mode. So did I get this to work? Well, the answer is no. And the main reason it didn't work was because of friction. Basically the standing wave was long gone before I could introduce any significant effect with the beat frequency. But that said, I did find that it was possible to redistribute energy in the string just using the injection of potential energy with specific frequencies and make the string switch modes. So the first one who knows how that would work and puts it into a comment below wins a pipe, a real one. Now because friction was the limiting factor in the experiment, I built a vacuum confinement for the setup. And the vacuum tube I made could easily be evacuated to below 20 millibars, thereby in theory reducing the friction with air by a factor of more than 50. However, when I measured the actual effect of the vacuum on the lifetime of transverse oscillations, the result turned out to be very disappointing. Here I measured how standing waves fade in the case of both air and vacuum. You observe that instead of a 100 millisecond decay time in air, it's now 200 milliseconds in vacuum. So only a factor of 2 and not the factor of 50 I had hoped for. This shows that a large part of the damping in the system is caused by other factors like the material of the string and the damping in the speakers and so putting everything in a vacuum wasn't really a very useful exercise. So I guess practical limitations kept me from demonstrating the analogy for wave energy absorption and make a string switch standing wave modes using the beat frequency. But what now if I was not limited by practicalities and could make anything I wanted? What would my ideal setup look like for the demo? Ideally the setup would consist of a purely elastic string without friction. The string would be indefinitely long to avoid reflections on the ends where we introduce a wave. Alternatively, you could also place damping devices at either one of the end stops if an infinitively long string is not an option. In this string we create a confinement in which we can introduce transverse waves containing a certain amount of energy. We could create these by switching on a transverse source for a limited amount of time and then switch it off. And since the string is purely elastic, the transverse standing wave would exist forever within the confinement. So now this confinement contains a very specific amount of wave energy. There are two things that I would like to add to this system. First, we want to be able to change the phase and the frequency of the energy contained. And second, we want the energy of the system to be able to interact with the energy in the space around it. In other words, the system should not be energetically isolated from the rest of space. So how can we achieve both? Well, we could replace the fixed end stops of the contained oscillation with a stop consisting of two wheels. By harmonically accelerating, for example, the left set of wheels in the longitudinal direction, you can effectively modify phase and frequency, and so redistribute wave energy and make one standing wave change into another. These wheels would effectively confine the transverse movement and allow for phase manipulation. But unfortunately, they would also allow potential energy contained in the elasticity of the string to leave the confinement, which would make the transverse wave gradually die out. But wait, what if we could make use of the rotational inertia of the wheels? Inertia would effectively block high frequency potential energy waves and prevent them from escaping, while allowing lower frequency energy to pass in and out of the confinement. And now I feel we're finally getting somewhere with our analogy. So let's think of what each of these components of the model would represent in the world of electromagnetic radiation and particles. The string would basically represent space, a purely elastic medium for all energy. It would allow energy to travel around with some maximum speed, but in fact only potential energy stored in the elasticity of space could reach that speed. This maximum speed would be the analog to the speed of light. The confined high frequency transverse wave would represent the total energy contained in a particle as momentum. The energy would be proportional to the transverse frequency, 
and the movement of the wave boundaries would represent the interaction with the electromagnetic field. Energy exchange between this field and the internal wave would only occur effectively at specific beat frequencies having the right phase, because only very specific frequencies would be stable within the confinement. But what would the wheels and their rotational inertia represent? Well, their role is to make energy transfer between the radiation and the electron possible and at the same time confine high frequency energy. So the wheels would also represent a property of space. In fact, they would represent some kind of spatial inertia. With this I don't mean the type of inertia that we generally associate with mass, because empty space apparently does not contain mass. No, this type of inertia would act purely by resisting the acceleration of energy. Now if you think empty space cannot have elasticity and inertia for energy, maybe think again, because how else can gravitational waves exist? The energy inertia of space, represented in the analogy by the wheels, would effectively allow low frequency energy to move around freely in space, but would confine any high frequency energy like the vibrational energy that's present in the electron. Just for fun, let's calculate the frequency of an electron at rest. We can do this by combining Einstein's mass-energy equivalency with Planck's relationship between energy and frequency. And we find that the electron at rest consists of a really high frequency vibration, more than five orders of magnitude higher than the frequencies present in visible light. A consequence of Spatial inertia would also be that it confines high frequency radiation waves, like that of X and gamma rays, who have frequencies similar to that of the electron. The inertia and elasticity of space together would allow the electromagnetic radiation to shift the frequency of matter. However, for a confined electron, which only knows specific energy states, it would mean that only specific frequencies of light will do the job. On top of that, the radiation would have to have the right phase, amplitude and duration to create a change in the energy state. And this would make the occurrence of energy exchange between matter and radiation fundamentally probabilistic. Sometimes I wish I were a poet, because then I could have told you all this in under 30 seconds. Matter, a trapped energy wave stuck between space's rigid embrace in a deep high-frequency cave, a vibrational mode that cannot replace, yet yearns to break free. Butting its head with inertial walls, trying to flee as it vibrates and calls. But when enough energy is amassed, again it beats the confinements of space, sending out messages, sometimes, at last, and thereby reveals us its long-hidden face. <laughs>